This is a rather interesting discourse because there's an awful lot of people that have different ideas about what voidness is and what it isn't. So I thought it would be a good idea to go to the suttas and see what the Buddha said about voidness. Okay, thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Sawati in the eastern park in the palace of Megara's mother. When it was evening, the Venerable Ananda arose from meditation, went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country, where there was a town of the Sakyans called Nagaraka, Raka. There, Venerable Sir, I heard and lent learned this from the Blessed One's own lip. Now, Ananda, I often abide in voidness. Did I hear that correctly, Venerable Sir? Did I learn that correctly, attend to that correctly, remember that correctly? Certainly, Ananda, you heard that correctly, learned that correctly, attended to that correctly, remembered it correctly. As formerly now, Ananda, I often abide in voidness. Ananda, just as this palace of Megara's mother is void of elephants, cattle, horses, and mares, void of gold and silver, void of the assembly of men and women, and there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the Sangha of monks. Now let me explain about Megara's mother's palace. Um, the Buddha's chief female supporter was named Visaka. And she was a, from a super wealthy family. And when she got married, she married into Megara's family. Megara was actually her father-in-law. But uh, he didn't really like her very much, and he started to look for things that would cause her embarrassment and maybe he could get rid of her so she'd be sent back to the other family. Um, she had a favorite horse and this horse was uh, giving birth to a fold. So she stayed up all night with the horse making sure that everything went well with it and that sort of thing. So she wasn't in the house in the morning when the father-in-law got up. Now one of the things that the tradition in India is that the the son and his wife always paid homage to the, the parents right after they got up. She wasn't there to do that, so he started criticizing her for that. Another time, um, he, Megara was eating food and a monk came to the door and uh, was on alms round and Megara ignored him. So Visaka said uh, that uh, please monk go somewhere else. Uh, Megara is eating stale fare stale, it's like stale food. And that really got him upset. So he, he wanted to cast her out of the house. But she had eight very wise people that they, it was like a court that uh, any, any grievance, they had to judge whether it was for real or not. So they went 
and then they convened this court and Megara got up and he said she wasn't there to pay homage one morning and that's the duty of the of the this uh, his uh, daughter-in-law to do that every morning why wasn't she there she was out fooling around in the, in the, the stables and she got up and said well actually uh, my favorite horse was giving birth, so I was helping with that process. And I stayed up all night so that I could help. And everything turned out just great. So he begrudgingly said, oh, well, that's okay. But then there was the time I was eating, and she, my, sis, my uh, daughter-in-law said that I'm eating stale food. And she said, no, I didn't say you were eating stale food. I said you were eating stale fare. Which means that your wealth right now has come to you because of your past action of generosity. But you're just living on that action. You're not creating new actions of generosity. So it's eating the stale karma and not creating new karma. And that's why I said that. She, he became so impressed with her that he said, from now on, I'm going to consi consider you my mother. So that's how Megara's mother got to be in the suttas. It's actually Visaka, is her name. And uh, it's kind of uh, an inside monk joke to call it the palace of Megara's mother. Now, when she got married, she was uh, quite an exceptional person. She was very strong in her body and uh, very beautiful. And came from a super, super rich family. And the gown that she got married in, it was made out of gold and many, many gems diamonds and rubies and sapphires and all of those kind of things. And because she had such exceptional physical strength, she could wear this without any problem. One day she and one of her attendants went to the, uh, listen to the Buddha give a talk after she was wearing this robe and she said, uh, I can't wear this in front of the Buddha, it's not right. So she gave it to her attendant after folding it up very nicely. And her attendant sat it down. And then they went to listen to the Dhamma talk. And they were so inspired by the talk that they left and forgot the rope. So Visaka, instead of becoming angry with the attendant, she was very happy that this happened and she said I want you to go back to the monastery to pick up this robe and bring it back but if Venerable Ananda has touched the robe out you have to leave it there. Venerable Ananda his habit was always going around cleaning things up so of course he got the robe and he put it in a place that was safe she found out that Venerable Ananda had touched the robe. So she went back and Visaka said, uh, you've given me an opportunity to make more merit. And she said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell this, this robe. And then with the money I get for this robe, I'm going to build a monastery for, for all of the monks. But nobody could afford it. So she bought it back herself. <laughs> and then she used that money for, it, it was such a spectacular place that they called it a palace. It had many, many rooms, it was many stories. Very nicely done. Very well done. So. This gives you an idea of some of the inside jokes that we have about this, of the monks. 
And when it says that there was no cattle, there was no uh, horses, there was no elephants, of course not. It was a monastery. And they didn't allow those kind of things in the monastery. They had to be, they, they were in stalls outside. Okay. Ananda, just as this palace of Magara's mother is void of elephants, cattle, horses, and mares, void of gold and silver, void of the assembly of men and women, there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the Sangha of monks. So too, a monk not attending to the perception of village, not attending to perception of people, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. His mind enters into that perception of forest and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be, dependent on the perception of village, those are not present here. Whatever disturbance there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. This field of perception is void of the perception of a village. This field of perception is void of the perception of people. There is only present this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the forest. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there. He understands that which is present, thus, this is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistur undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Now, did you understand that? If you, uh, you go into the forest from a village where there's a lot of people, you leave the village and you leave all of those people alone and your only perception now is in the forest. So you're void of the village and you're void of the people. Now your only perception is in the, in the forest. And that's the way the Buddha was talking about voidness. He's saying there's these things are void, but there is the perception of something else that's there. It's not that everything is void. There's still the perception of the forest. And we go on and we go deeper and deeper into this. But this gives you more of the idea of what the Buddha was talking about when he was talking, when he was talking about voidness or emptiness. So the the your perception of the village and your perception of people is empty in your in your perception. It's not there anymore. There is only this perception, forest. So this statement, thus he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present, thus, this is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of people, not attending to the perception of forest, attendant, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth, He's using earth as his meditation, which is a very specialized kind of meditation. 
but we can change that just to say that uh, we could say instead of perception of earth, we could say perception of loving kindness. It's basically the same thing. Any of the objects of meditation that the Buddha taught can be added in here. His mind enters a enters into that perception of earth and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. Just as a bull's hide becomes free from folds when fully stretched with a hundred pegs, so too a monk not attending to any of the ridges and hollows of this earth, to the rivers and ravines, and the tracks of stumps and thorns, the mountains and uneven places, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. His mind enters into that perception of earth and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of forest, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of people. This field of perception is void of the perception of forest. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of forest, not attending to the perception of earth, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. Now, before we get too far gone in this, what we're really talking about here is that he was talking about with the earth or with loving kindness or whatever kind of meditation you're doing, getting to the fourth jhana. And these are called the material jhanas. These are levels of understanding where there are certain things that happen. Uh, as you get from the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, your level of equanimity, balance of mind, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And then you get into what the Buddha called the arupa jhanas, the immaterial realms. And that is infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. This is where you, um, you don't have any feeling in your body unless there is contact. If I come and I touch you, you will know that that happens sound you will be able to hear, but it, your equanimity is so strong that it doesn't make your mind shake. You hear the sound, it just goes through. This is different than the descriptions of a lot of the other uh, one-pointed kinds of concentration, where they say, you don't have any feeling in your body at all, no matter what happens. I can come and I can move your hand. You wouldn't know that your hand was moved. I could make loud sounds right beside your ear. You wouldn't hear that at all. You wouldn't know that it happened. And that is a way that they test to see whether someone is in deep concentration or not. 
by touching them and making sounds and seeing if there's any kind of reaction. But that is when you don't add that extra step of relaxing. Your mind will become very deeply focused just on one thing. You become very, very tranquil and very, very peaceful, but your mind just stays on one thing only. It doesn't move. When you're practicing the way that the Buddha was talking about, you're still able to see things and hear things. And when I say see things, you're able to recognize with your mind these things when they come up. So you're still learning how this process of the, the, the dependent origination arises. So you're, you're able to see that there's contact, and then there's feeling, and then there's craving, and then there's clinging, and then your habitual tendency. You'll be able to see these things. And as soon as you start recognizing when mind starts to get tight, you start relaxing right then. You go deeper into your meditation. Now, that one of the advantages of doing this meditation is when your, mind, when your mindfulness slips, when your mindfulness is not always as sharp as it could be, what happens is one of the hindrances can arise. And this is a good thing. The hindrances, I like it mind, I don't like it mind, that's uh, greedy mind, hatred mind. Dullness, you don't have sleepiness at this level. Um, restlessness, you can still have some doubt, but it's really very faint by this time. When these hindrances arise, they will take you away from the meditation. But you recognize that and you let it be and you relax and you come back. Now you start to see how your mind's attention moves away from being with your object of meditation to being on the hindrance. See, that's always the test and you get to see at deeper and deeper levels how this process works. You start catching it a lot more quickly, you start relaxing into it much more easily. And you're starting to see that all of these things is part of an impersonal process. It's part of, because this arose, and that feeling arose, because that feeling arose, the craving is there, let go of the craving, your mind is brilliant and clear and bright. As you let go of the hindrance, then you go deeper into your meditation. So you need the hindrances. When you practice one-pointed concentration, which is mostly being taught in the world today, that doesn't add that extra step of relaxing. And that extra step is very, very important for the Buddha's teaching. When you don't add that one extra step, your mind becomes very, very concentrated. But the force of the concentration stops the hindrances from coming up. So you don't really have that process of learning how all of these things arise and how, how to let go of them and end. You're not learning very much. Your, your mind becomes just stuck on one thing. Even though it's peaceful and calm, being stuck on one thing means that you don't gain more knowledge and vision. You don't gain more understanding of how the process works. And the whole thing, from, from the very first day that you start meditating until you're done, 
until you attain Nibbana. The whole of the process is learning how to see mind's attention, how it moves from one thing to another. You're training yourself to see it more and more uh, easily, more and more quickly, more and more clearly. And as you do that, it's so much easier to recognize and not get caught personally with thoughts and feelings that arise. Now this is a process that you see very, very closely when you're sitting in meditation. But as you're able to recognize that when you're doing your quiet meditation, then your daily meditation, you're able to see the hindrances when they come up more quickly and more easily. So you start letting go of those. So you start gaining balance all of the time. In your daily life, your, your, uh, your children or your husband or your wife will start to notice that you don't get angry like you used to. That you, you take care of things without having the emotional ups and downs. Now, now you still have the problems, but they're not such big problems to you. And that's the way, one of the ways that you tell that you're progressing in your practice is that the things that used to get you mad, they don't get you mad so much anymore. And your sense of humor starts to improve. You start laughing with things. And you'll, you'll, you'll start noticing. Somebody can come up and tell you a joke and it puts down one ethnic group or another, whatever. And it's not funny to you. But they come up and they tell you something that their child did that was just great. And you find yourself smiling and laughing because of that. Because that was a happy moment. So your sense of humor starts to change as you go deeper in your meditation. Okay, so we, we were at the base of infinite space, his mind enters into that perception of the base of infinite space and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of forest, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of earth, those are not present here. There is only present this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier <coughs> earlier on that the earth was the object of meditation in this particular sutta. Yes. So that means that if you would do the casinas in this stage, you will not, will not be watching the casinas any longer? Or? Because that's what it just said, right? Or am I hearing it something? That's what it just said. You see, I've never run across a teacher mm -hmm that has been able to teach me casinas to my satisfaction. And I've looked, believe me, I've looked. Mm. So I don't know how quite to answer you. Mm. Because when you do the way the Buddha teaches and add that extra step, the casina has always been a one-pointed kind of concentration. Mm -hmm. And with that, you stay with, they call it the nimitta. It's a sign that comes up in your mind. It's like a, a silver moon. It's kind of shiny.
So you wouldn't stay with the Earth Casina anymore when you have that arise. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, that arises before you get into the jhana. So you wouldn't be with the Earth Casina even while you were in the first jhana. You would be in the uh, with the the uh, perception of that that nimitta, that sign that comes up in your mind. And, and if you would replace another... Uh... So that's why I suggested you could replace it with loving-kindness. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the fourth jhana, the loving-kindness changes. Mm -hmm. Or right after the fourth jhana, when you start to get into the arupa jhanas, it changes. And that's why I like that example better, because I understand it. I see. Mm -hmm. How, how does it work for if you do uh, Anapanasati, like watching the breath? Um, you still have all of these things arising, but you're staying with the breath and relaxing. And then you notice the expansion of infinite space and that sort of thing. It doesn't really change. The breath doesn't change at all. It stays the same and you relax in the same way, but you start observing other things that arise. So it's kind of a, this sutta is a, is a blessing in some ways and a curse in another because it is talking about the casinas. And like I said, I went, I went through Burma mm -hmm. begging for somebody to teach me casinas. Everybody talks about, well, uh, there's real advantage of doing this casino or that <laughs> casino, but nobody told me how to do it. And I went through Thailand, I went through Sri Lanka looking. I couldn't find anybody. Everybody talks about it, but nobody talks about how, how to do it. And, and, and I have run across teachers that teach the meditation very similar to the way that I teach. Mm -hmm. And they can't, they can't explain the casino meditation at all. They come up with some imaginary thing, but it doesn't have anything to do with the actual practice. Mm -hmm. when, when I started out doing so much meditation, I wanted to be a very well-rounded meditator that any kind of meditation that the Buddha taught, I wanted to be able to have the experience of being able to do it. And I couldn't do it because there wasn't a teacher of the casino. And that's eight meditations right there. Can you explain uh, a little detail on that kind of meditation? Well, it's a one-pointed kind of meditation that is being practiced right now. I don't know how the Buddha taught it or if he actually taught it. Now this, see, the thing is about 250 years after the Buddha died, there were a lot of Hindus and Brahmins that started wearing robes, but they were teaching their Hindu and the Vedas and all of that sort of thing. And uh, they were mixing a lot of the meditation techniques that the Vedas say and they were using Buddhist terminology. Uh, eventually, they were uh, expelled from, they couldn't wear those robes anymore. They were questioned on what the Buddha taught, and they didn't know what the Buddha taught, so they, they had to disrobe. They took on the robes because they could get free food. And uh, that was very appealing to them. But a lot of their ideas are still mixed up in the suttas themselves. And the one-pointed concentration got very, uh, very mixed up with the Buddha's teaching. And because of that, there's been um, major problems 
with being able to attain Nibbana the way the Buddha was talking about. Because the one-pointed concentration, he practiced that when he was a bodhisattva, and he said, I've gone as far as I can go with this. This does not lead to Nibbana. I quit. I don't want to do that anymore. It doesn't work. So that's why he went out on his own. And he found this one extra step and the importance of adding that into the meditation and how it changed the entire meditation, not just a little bit, but a lot. So you could see the individual pieces of how everything works. You can see that, you can recognize that, you can let it go. And when you do that, you let go of the suffering. It takes practice. This is a gradual teaching and a gradual learning. It happens a lot faster than it does with other meditations. I can guarantee you that. But it still, it doesn't happen right away. So you have to have some patience when you do your practice. But the, the earth Casino, what it basically is, the way that it's described in commentaries, which I find suspect. They had, they had a lot of Veda, I, Vedic ideas in there. It is a disc that's about this big. And you take soil and, and mud and put on a piece of cloth over the disc and let it dry and then you hold it up or hang it up and you start staring at it, just saying, Earth, 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 Earth. Now, that's, they, do, they do that with um, all of the elements. And with some of the elements, it's a hole that's cut out of a piece of wood or something yeah. like that, where they would put in front of a fire and you would look at the fire and you'd say, Fire, 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 Fire. Oh. So there, that's how the casina, casina basically means a round disc. Now there can be a disc that you stare at, or it can be a disc that you're looking through. And there's, uh, there's four colors, of which there's a lot of fighting about what those four colors are. Some people say that brown is mixed in with it. Other people say there's blue mixed in with it. Some people say there's green. There's all of these different ideas of the colors. That leads me to think that that, uh, that wasn't part of the Buddha's teaching. But the kasinas are mentioned a few times in the suttas. And it might be that was because of the Brahmin influence. I just don't know. Because I certainly haven't run across anybody who can understand it according to the way the Buddha teaches it. See, that extra step of relaxing is so incredibly important, and when it's not in that meditation, then it is suspect of being something other than the Buddha's teaching. And I haven't run across anybody <coughs> that teaches it with the relaxing step in it. I have considered spending time doing a casino with a relaxing set to see what happens. Maybe one of these days, I don't know. <coughs> Why don't you do it and then come back and report to me? Oh, I'll just multiply myself. It works. <laughs> So when you get to the realm of infinite space, what you feel is there's a feeling of expansion that just keeps going out and out and out, and it goes in all the directions at the same time. But there's no center point. It's just a feeling of expansion. So, thus he regards it as as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present, thus. This is present, 
thus Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of earth, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, attends to the singleness de dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. His mind enters into that perception of the base of infinite consciousness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of earth, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of earth. This field of perception is void of the perception of infinite space. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. So, what happens when you get into infinite consciousness is you start seeing individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. Now, that was a million consciousnesses arising and passing away. So we're talking about being able to see this very, very finely. And you're looking at something and you'll see, it will be like you're seeing something, but you're seeing it like it's a movie that's going too slow and there's a flicker in between each uh, picture. Okay, that's what it's like, but it's like that with all of the sense doors. With the ear, with the tongue, with the nose, with the body, feeling, and with, with mind. You see mind arising and passing away very quickly. When you see this, you are very, very <coughs> convinced that everything is impermanent. Nothing is, is like we think it is. We like to think that everything is permanent. We're always looking for things that are permanent. But when you start seeing the individual consciousnesses arise and pass away, arise and pass away, you start seeing the unsatisfactory nature of this. There's nothing that's permanent. Because of that, it's a form of suffering. It's a form of unsatisfactoriness. Because it's always changing. And you see that there is no controller at all. These things happen because the conditions are right for you to see. So you see, and you see it as individual consciousnesses arising and passing away. But there's no self in that. There's no, it's not personal at all. This is an impersonal process that is happening. Because the eye hits color and form, the, the meeting of the three is eye consciousness. With, that's called uh, contact. And then a feeling arises and all of the rest of the, the dependent origination. So what you're learning how to do when you get to that is see the individual consciousnesses and relax into that. Then you start looking more at the space in between those consciousnesses. And it's at the, the blink in between is a little bit longer and a little bit longer as you, you become more familiar with the process. Okay. Again, Ananda, a monk, not attending to the perception of earth, not attending to the perception... I've just read that. 
Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. His mind enters into that perception of the base of nothingness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. Those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. Those are not present here. There is only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. There is only present this non-voidness namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. Now, when you get into the base of nothingness, what happens is mind is not looking outside of itself anymore. There are still things that are happening, but they're more like uh, factors that arise. It's not so much <coughs> seeing and thinking and, and getting caught up in the six senses anymore, but you're starting to see mind in a lot more clear way. And what you're starting to do is to recognize how to keep that equanimity, that balance of mind going without getting caught up with putting too much energy into watching or not enough energy. So now you're starting to, to learn how to fine-tune your meditation when you get to this stage. Now this, uh, I know an awful lot of monks that are teaching meditation and they, they won't even talk about these kind of things because they say it takes you years and years and years to get to this. I'm here to tell you it doesn't. It doesn't take years and years when you're practicing with that relaxing step. It can it can take up to a year for some people. <clears throat> it depends on how much you do it, how much how much you meditate, how clear you are on what you're seeing while you're doing your meditation. I have seen some people that can do it in seven days when they come <clears throat> and do a retreat. Some people are slow, they take eight. <laughs> I take ten. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a real, real, this is probably the most interesting state in the meditation, at least it seems that to me. Because it is such fine tuning that you have to do if you're a little bit too much energy and watching, then you, your mind gets a little restless and you have to work with that and let it go. And then not quite enough, your mind gets a little dull and you have to work with that. So now you're getting to really see what fine tuning is all about because it's just little tiny bits of energy that you're working with. And it's real fun. Again, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. His mind enters into that perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, 
those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness, those are not present here. There is only present this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. There is only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. What happens get into neither perception nor non-perception where before you were feeling your mind expand out, now it starts to get very, very small and very, very tiny, and it gets to be hard to tell whether it's really there or not. And there still is some things that are arising in this state, but you won't notice it until you get out of that state and then you start to reflect on what happened while you were in that, that meditation state. By now, you've got the habit of relaxing. Every time mind wobbles a little tiny bit, then there's the relaxing and letting go of that. See, the relaxing is the state that brings up the cessation of the Uh, the cessation of all kinds of movement and suffering that happens in the mind. So what you're doing is you're practicing how to become more and more calm. And when you do that, your mind might be moving like this. And as you practice more and more, it becomes less and less and less and less until finally it's hard to tell whether there's any movement there or not. There is some, but not much. There's still feeling there. There's still, <coughs> kind of, there's still perception. It's hard to talk about because it's, it's such a tiny little bit. But this is not Nibbana yet. Thus he, regard, thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present, thus this is present. Thus Ananda, this too is his genuine undistorted pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, non attends to the singleness dependent on the signless concentration of mind. He enters into that signless concentration of mind and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be, dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. So what happens is, as you continually go and you continually relax more and more, you will get to a state where there's no movement of mind. Body is still here, but you don't see it. It's just like somebody turning off the lights. There's, you, you're not able to see anything at all. You'll be in that state for a little while. 
There's no movement lines of tension at all. Absolutely none. You come out of that state, and the first thing you see is how mind's attention and how the process of mind occurring happens. And you see ignorance, and with ignorance as condition you see mental formations. With mental formations as condition you see consciousness. With cons as condition you see mentality, materiality. With mentality, materiality as condition, you see the six sense bases. With the six sense bases as condition, you see contact. <laughs> With contact as condition, feeling arises. With feeling as condition, craving arises. With craving as condition, clinging arises. With clinging as condition, habitual tendency arises. With habitual tendency as condition, birth arises. With birth as condition, old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair arise. This is this whole mass of suffering. This is how it works. And you see this. It will happen very fast and your attention is so strong that you'll be able to recognize all of these different states. And then it will occur to you to notice that when ignorance does not arise, then the, the mental formations don't arise. If the mental formations don't arise, consciousness won't arise. If consciousness doesn't arise, mentality, materiality won't arise. If mentality, materiality doesn't arise, the six sense bases don't arise. If the six sense bases don't arise, contact won't arise. If contact doesn't arise, then feeling won't arise. If feeling won't arise, craving won't arise. When craving won't arise, clinging won't arise. When clinging won't arise, your habitual tendency won't arise. When the habitual tendency doesn't arise, birth doesn't arise. If birth doesn't arise, old age and death, pain, sorrow, lamentation, they all will not arise. Now this is a cessation of this whole mass of suffering. And when you see that, your understanding is so brilliant at that time that you experience Nibbana. That's the way you get to understand how the process works. That's how you never have any doubt again as to whether this is real or not. And you see that this is all part of an impersonal process. It carries on because of conditions. That's how it arises. And that's how it ceases. So when you have the experience of Nibbana, it's not this mystical, mas magical flash what it is, is your deep understanding and seeing very clearly how this process works. So that, that, that's a little bit different than a lot of people are teaching these days. So like the, the ending point is a state of emptiness? Well, when you see the cessation, the complete <coughs> cessation, that is Nibbana, but it's not empty of, it's not nothing. It is something, but it's difficult to talk about because it's an unconditioned state. Everything we know is conditioned. So I, I 
get away from talking about what Nibbana is because you can't talk about it. Any way of talking about it is putting conditions on it. And it's unconditioned. It's beyond that. So, we will fear when we get in there. Yeah, you'll know, <laughs> then come back and tell me. <laughs> through the variation state. And if conditions and, are right, we'll get in there. No. And the thing is, right after you have this experience, there is so much relief. You've been carrying around this burden of always thinking that everything is personal and seeing things in a very uh, distant way, not seeing closely. And now you understand, oh, and you will be happy for a few days, like you've never been happy before. And even after that experience, it still has effects on the way you see the world around you. Now, what I just described to you is called the path knowledge. That isn't the end of the road. Just having the path knowledge there's, there is some personality change, but not a lot. You will have to have this experience again. That is the cessation of perception and feeling. And then when you get out of that, you will see dependent origination arising and passing in away. That, when that happens, that is what you call the fruition knowledge, and that's where the personality development really takes place. If you're doing it through meditation, then that will happen in such a way that lust and greed will never enter your mind again. Lust and hatred, I mean. Now think about that. Your mind will never get angry again. Yeah, it's, it's worth working for. You never have any doubt. You see everything as part of an impersonal process. You never take things personally anymore. That means you have this balanced mind that's balanced all the time. You never have any doubt whether this is the right way to go or not. You know it's the right way to go because of your deep experience. So it's really uh, nice when you can get the fruition. Now the fruition can happen at any time. You do your meditation and you get the path knowledge and then you go home and you start washing the dishes and you feel your mind starting to go very deep or you're cleaning the, the house, or you're doing something. And you say, well, let's let that go. And then you sit for a little while, and you watch your mind go deep, and experience that cessation of perception and feeling. And then you see the dependent origination arising and passing away. And you might see it three times, or you might see it four times, depending on uh, what your experience is. And after that, you have, it, it's completely unshakable that you will never have anger arise in your mind again. You never have lust, greed for things. So it's definitely worth working for, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> he understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. This field of perception is void of the base of the perception, the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. 
There is only present this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six sense bases that are dependent on the body and conditioned by life. In other words, you can sit for a period of time up to seven days and your body will stay alive. But there, there's no disturbance in your mind at all. There is no perception. There is no feeling. After seven days. For seven days you can do this. And I did know one person that did that. And I said, why? And they said, see, I gave them a one, one word question, they gave me a one word answer. <laughs> Relief. Think about that you're not having any disturbance in your mind at all for that period of time. There's so much relief that happens because there is no movement and, and the thoughts coming in and that sort of thing. It's just <laughs> at ease. <laughs> so I heard that um, some Vietnamese monks do that um, um, why they do hunger strike. Is that why they, they meditate? They don't feel the need to eat? Right? Um, unless I talk with the monks about that, I don't know. I'd have to talk with the individual monk to see what was happening. There is uh, states that you can get into that the devas, the heavenly beings, will pour food into your pores so you don't have to eat for long periods of time or drink. Um, there are those states, and that might be what they're getting into, or maybe not. I'd have to talk with them individually to see. So it, it's a difficult question to give you a definite answer on. Okay, he understands this signless concentration of mind is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent and subject to cessation. When he notes and sees thus, his mind is liber liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of sensual desire, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of being, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of ignorance, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. He understands this field of perception is void of the taint of sensual desire. This field of perception is void, void of the taint of being. This field of perception is void of the taint of ignorance. There is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains he understands that which is present thus, this is present. 
Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness, supreme and unsurpassed. Ananda, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past, entered upon and abided in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all entered upon and abided in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. All will enter upon and abide in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. All enter upon and abide in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Therefore, Ananda, you should train thus. We will enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. That is what the Buddha said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's word. So, that gives you an idea of what to look forward to. It's way too high that I can't comprehend it. Um, as you get more settled in your meditation, it will start to make more and more sense, I promise. I, I know that it was an advanced teaching today. But it's, uh, it's real good to become familiar with it, even if you don't, don't quite understand what I was saying. As you hear it over and over again, which you will, then uh, it becomes more clear as you go deeper in your meditation. Can I get a written um, copy of that section so I can maybe just read it and try to understand it? On the website, there are a lot of things that where there are peacekeeping talks mm -hmm. and there are transcripts mm -hmm. too. And you can get the transcript and follow it while you listen to the talk. Mm -hmm. That helps you when there's a yeah. language difference, and that really does yeah. help you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are things on the, um, the Dhamma Sukha list that we put for you to help you learn the links mm -hmm. and to learn different uh, things about the meditation. That's, so, that's a good point because for me, I learned the Buddhism from Vietnamese. Sure. And then here's in English, so I kind of have to yeah. translate between the yeah. two languages. Yeah. And yeah. The, 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 the terms are going to be different, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have some things written out, some little charts and little things like that you can watch when he's teaching this part and it helps you to. We need some time to digest. <laughs> yeah, to digest and practice. Practice the meditation. That's the one. So she's going to have a meditation class somewhere in the area. On Tuesdays? We were going to do Tuesdays from 7 to 9, but then some of you, that didn't work for some of them. Oh. So we have to talk about when. I can do Tuesdays. I can do it. You can do Tuesdays? Yeah. Can you do Tuesdays? Tuesdays are better than Monday. <laughs> better than Monday. Yeah. I think everybody else wants Okay, Tuesday. then good. We'll do Tuesdays. Next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and what, what they will do is you're going to play some of the Dhamma talks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm but also talking about your own practice if you have any questions. Yeah. That sort of thing. Okay, let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. 
may they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhus.